Hi everyone, it's Lauren and welcome back to my series on Shakespeare. In this video I'm going to be looking at and analysing Shakespeare's play Macbeth. If you'd like to see more videos in this series I will leave a link to it in the description box below and you can find videos there on how to read Shakespeare and some other videos on Shakespeare's individual plays as well. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the plot of Macbeth and then have a chat about some of the themes and the interesting things that are happening with the characters in the play. The play famously opens with the three witches. King Duncan of Scotland has been fending off a Norwegian invasion and two of his lords who have been on the battlefield with him, Macbeth and Banquo, stumble across these three witches. They then very enigmatically bestow some prophecies upon Macbeth and Banquo. To Macbeth they say, Hail Thane of Glams, which Macbeth is currently, Hail Thane of Cawdor, and Hail he will be king hereafter. To Banquo they say, You will not be king yourself, but your sons will be kings, you will beget a line of kings. So they vanish then very mysteriously and Macbeth and Banquo are quite sceptical about this and they're saying this is very odd they're saying they're calling me Thane of Cawdor I'm not Thane of Cawdor they say you won't be king but your sons will be kings what's going on here however immediately after leaving the witches um, a messenger from the king comes saying to Macbeth you have just been made Thane of Cawdor because the Thane of Cawdor was treacherous within this battle that we've just had and very, very quickly, Macbeth then starts to change his mind and thinks this first prophecy has come true. I am now Thane of Cawdor. So what he does is he sends a letter to his wife, Lady Macbeth, saying that the king and all of their lords are gonna come and stay in the castle and relaying this prophecy to her. She equally, very quickly, then gets on board with the idea that Macbeth is going to become king and starts plotting how they can make this come to pass. When Macbeth returns home, they plot to murder King Duncan. They decide to get his guards drunk and kill him at night and then plant the daggers on them so it looks like that they have killed the king. So this is exactly what they do. The king's sons, Malcolm and Donald Blaine, flee Scotland straight away, very rightly assuming that someone who killed their father will have it in for them as well. And so Macbeth, who is a cousin of the king, is then crowned king himself. After this, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth start on a psychological tumble into guilt and paranoia. Um, Macbeth then worries that Banquo's sons will be king, so he tries to have Banquo killed. Banquo is killed, but his son Fleance escapes. Macbeth also orders the death of Macduff, um, who is another loyal lord. He has gone to England to see the king's son, Malcolm, and while he's away, his entire family is killed. On the back of this, Malcolm and Macduff launch a revenge attack on Macbeth. At this point, Macbeth is very worried and very paranoid about his position as king, so he goes to visit the three witches again. They give him another set of prophecies. They tell him that he cannot be killed by any man of woman born, and that he will be king until Burnham Wood comes to to Dunsinane where the castle is and so Macbeth thinks oh that's fine then because woods can't move and every man is of woman born so I'm going to be fine. However very neatly and very nicely this all climaxes into a large battle at the end where Malcolm's troops hide themselves under branches of the trees of Burnham Wood and um, so it appears that the wood is coming to the castle and Macduff tells Macbeth just before he fights him that he was from his mother's womb untimely ripped as in he was born by cesarean section so he is not technically of woman born. Macduff kills Macbeth, Lady Macbeth commits suicide off stage, and Malcolm is crowned king. The historical context of this play is quite interesting. It's thought to have been written just a few years into the reign of King James I of England, who was, and was previously, King James VI of Scotland. Elizabeth I died without any children, so King James VI of Scotland then became the rightful heir of England as well. He is also thought to have been a descendant of Banquo, so this play is very much pandering to his um, royal lineage and it's a part of Scottish past which King James I himself would have known well or would have at least thought that this was part of his heritage. He was also very superstitious, very interested in witches, so you can see how this play really is a pandering to James I's tastes. There are some really interesting themes and juxtapositions happening within Macbeth. Some of the most obvious themes are of course ambition and violence and then the after psychological effects of that violence. But what's interesting here is that Shakespeare is also linking that psychological after effect and the act of violence it's, itself 
to a supernatural, unnatural world. We have the witches themselves who are orchestrating Macbeth's downfall for reasons unknown, but we also have words from other minor characters and comments about the state of nature at this time. The doorman, for example, talks about animals acting very weirdly, owls screeching and horses butting in their stables. There's lots of odd things happening, and it's very much this feeling that murder is so unnatural, um, that almost nature is adverse to it, is rejecting this act. Or on the other hand, you could see that nature and the witches themselves has become contaminated as they are pushing towards these unnatural acts that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are about to commit. And then Lady Macbeth and Macbeth themselves have these supernatural-esque experiences. When Macbeth goes to kill Duncan beforehand, he has the famous, is this a dagger I see before me speech where he is seeing um, visions of daggers. Afterwards and during the murder, he says that he hears a knocking he also says that he heard a voice yell out. We also have a dining scene later on in the play where Macbeth sees Banquo's ghost um, preside over the table and starts confessing and panicking and Lady Macbeth has to try and cover it up. And then nearer the end of the play we see Lady Macbeth who is suffering under her guilt so much that she is sleepwalking and seeing visions where we have again the famous out damned spot um, speech. The characters of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth and how they change between the beginning of the play and at the end is one of the things that is threading through this whole play and driving it forward. What's really interesting is that at the beginning Macbeth is actually quite sceptical of the witch's prophecies until the first prophecy comes true and then immediately he starts believing it. He writes to Lady Macbeth who equally seems so eager to believe this that straight away without really very much prompting she starts planning a murder of Duncan which does beg the question have the Macbeths thought about this before, have they be, always been this ambitious? Um, Macbeth is Duncan's cousin, so it isn't improbable that he could have been named Duncan's heir. This is an opportunity which has just sprung itself upon them. But is it an opportunity that they have been hoping for? Is it one that they've been planning for? Have the witches speaking to Macbeth, is that really just an excuse just to give them permission to then carry out this murder? Or is it really as it appears that they have just heard that Macbeth will become king? So therefore they very quickly put this plan in together to murder Duncan. It's quite interesting because Lady Macbeth is so ruthless in her ambitions. Um, she really is the driving force at the beginning of the play. If it had been left to Macbeth alone, he probably wouldn't have taken this opportunity to kill Duncan. At least that's the way it's presented. He's very hesitant. Um, he struggles throughout the murder to actually commit it. And then after he's killed Duncan and stabbed him, he comes back to Lady Macbeth with the bloody daggers and he's in an absolute state. He's panicking. Lady Macbeth has to take the daggers back herself and plant them on the guards and finish the deed because Macbeth is incapable of doing it. She really is the strong force. She says, a little water clears us of this deed. Um, this is all fine. Don't worry about it. Go to sleep and it will all be okay in the morning. Throughout the first half of the play, Macbeth continues to be very panicked about his position as king. He's very paranoid, especially about the prophecy concerning Banquo. And so he also starts to become more ruthless um, even within his paranoia. He orders Banquo and his son to be killed. Lady Macbeth at this point is still a very firm, um, guiding force. She's actually helping Macbeth when he's panicking and seeing Banquo's ghost, you see that she is still very stable at this point, whereas he is kind of on the edge. And then as the play progresses, they almost reverse. Lady Macbeth descends into this madness. The doctors find her sleepwalking and she's completely wracked with guilt about what she's done and what Macbeth is doing. Whereas Macbeth, especially after he sees the witches for a second time, becomes full of arrogance, full of confidence. He thinks he's invincible and it's a complete change to the Macbeth that we saw at the beginning of the play. Another really interesting technique within this play is that of what is seen and what is unseen, both by the characters and by the audience. So for example, you have Lady Macbeth committing suicide, but this happens off stage. It's a very, very violent play. There's a lot of blood in this play 
And yet a lot of that happens off stage as well. Duncan's murder happens off stage, most of the battles are off stage. Macduff's family are killed while he is not there, so he is told about it later from a messenger, he doesn't witness it himself. And there's an interesting parallel between Banquo's son Fleance and Duncan's son Malcolm, fleeing from where their fathers are murdered and because they have fleed, because they knew that they were in danger as well, there is then suspicion surrounding who actually committed the murder and the princes end up putting themselves in the frame for Duncan's murder which allows Macbeth to get away with it because that's the way that this situation seems to everybody else. Equally we have Macbeth and Lady Macbeth seeing things that other people can't see. So for example when Macbeth is seeing the dagger before him, he's on stage at this point but the audience can't see this dagger, he He's explaining it to us. Um, Lady Macbeth is trying to rub spots out of her hands, no one else can see those. And then later on Macbeth sees Banquo's ghost. M Banquo's ghost comes on and as the audience we can see Banquo's ghost but the rest of the people around the table can't see him. So it's a really interesting question as to how much of this is in Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's mind, how much of it is psychological and how much of it is supernatural. With the witches themselves it's quite an interesting um, theory because Banquo and Macbeth both see the witches so they can corroborate that they were there um, but if Banquo hadn't have been there would we even believe that these witches existed at all? We also have this chatter around the castle of these odd unnatural things happening within nature um, so there is a lot of talk about odd things happening but it's really interesting to analyse where that line might be between what is supernatural um, objectively and what really is just the result of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's psychological breakdown. And we see this come up again in another minor theme that comes through of the idea of sleep. Um, Duncan is murdered while he's sleeping and Macbeth hears his voice while he murders him saying sleep no more, Macbeth hath murdered sleep. Um, later on Lady Macbeth when she's in her somnambulistic sleepwalking state is at this point between sleep and awake and almost between life and death and it's an interesting examination of that point between life and death, between the real world and the supernatural world and whether we can trust our senses as what we're seeing is true or not. I would love to keep discussing this play because there's so many interesting things that I could talk about but I'm just not Going to have enough time so I would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts on Macbeth if you read it do let me know if there are other plays by Shakespeare that you would like me to do a video on and I will see you next time bye